All right. So you guys like the icon that we have? Yeah, so I got a question about the icon. Uh, it's, uh, the, it's, a, it's called the Pondicrater icon. And Pondicrater, if you, in English, Father um, put it in English, uh, so it, it means God Almighty, the Lord Almighty. That's what Pondicrater means. And uh, so I was asked, why is the Pondicrater the one at the top of the dome? Um, there's this connotation with uh, um, Pondicrater, also in Greek, Pondicrater, uh, also in Greek is pantheism. I don't know, have you ever heard the term pantheism? <coughs> pantheism is a kind of a belief that, uh, that God dwells in everything and is everywhere, right? And so that same thing kind of exhibits in this, the term panocrater, the Lord Almighty. It means that God is everywhere and that he's all seeing and he's above all things. And so being above all things, he is looking down upon everything and all of us. And so that's why the panocrater is at the top of the dome, okay? So that was a question I actually can answer easy. One of the few questions I can give you an answer to, probably. All right. Someone wrote me a question here. I don't know. They're obviously not in probably here. They left, but um, it says, what is the significance and or necessity of physically consuming the body and blood of Christ? Okay. Well, before I, I'd say what the necessity is, um, why don't we just say that that's uh, first off it was commanded by Christ right mm -hmm. it was commanded by Christ so does it does it even if it served no need at all we should be obedient to God and God commanded it in the New Testament he says take eat all of you do this as often as you can okay so uh, we can talk about what we get out of it I think that's what they're trying to trying to get to here but first off we should say it's a command from God and uh, not only is it a, c a command from God, it's so much so that it's in the canons that, and we don't hear this very often, but if you don't take communion um, every three weeks at least, the canons say, without a good reason, if you're traveling or you don't have, you know, you're ill, that's obviously not considered part of this. But if you go to church for three weeks and you don't take communion, you've excommunicated yourself. It's the, that's the canons. Strictly, you've excommunicated. So we've gotten a long way from that now in our modern day practices, right? Where that's it's just commonplace. People often don't go to communion that often. So, but, so let's just start with the rules. That's the rules of the church. That's not Father Michael's commentary. That's the canons. So what's the necessity? So when I say, what is the need? So what do we get out of it? Well, we get God within us. We get the very blood, body and blood of Christ. And within that, we get... All that comes with that, that means the grace of God. So we, we receive, if we prepare it properly and we receive it, we receive the grace of God, uh, which brings us a, a peace and, uh, and strength, a spiritual strength to battle in this world. We need that. Um, the the uh, St. Basil the Great, the preparation prayers for Saint, from St. Saint Basil says that uh, um, if we, uh, we become to pray for the spiritual wolf if we abstain too often from it. It's his words. St. Basil the Great, uh, we become the prey for the spiritual wolf if we abstain from communion, okay? So that's what happens, we become prey. We become prey for when the spiritual wolf is the Satan, the devil, the evil one. He knows that when, with the body and blood strengthens us and gives us uh, a grace, peace, and hope, and love. For, and so without it, we become in a rut, and, and we be, become uh, susceptible to you know, influence, uh, negative influence from, from the spiritual one, okay? It's almost like a, it's a cleansing, and if you know that you probably didn't do what you should have, it gives you a chance to do it over again. Yes, well, over yes, again. some people, uh, you know, the thing with taking communion is um, we all, it's a twofold thing. Like if we abstain, we become prey uh, for the spiritual wolf, but if we also take it unworthily, we become prey for the spiritual wolf. All right, we, we, we go to communion unworthily. Uh, we know that it can affect our spiritual and, and even our bodily health. We know this from the scriptures from the Apostle Paul. Um, so we, we have to find this middle balance of, of knowing that we need it and we have to really force ourselves to make a habit of going 
um, to be able to receive this grace, but also knowing that we can't just go haphazardly, right? We can't make it a, a routine that we do. And I know that it's so common in, in such, in, especially in Western confessions, go to the Roman Catholic Church, you'll see everyone just line up like a, like a, like like they're, you know, cattle, right? To take communion. I'm not trying to be mean. That's just where it's came. There's no preparation for that. So we want to avoid that extreme, but we want to avoid the extreme that we don't go either, except but very few times, okay? So we need to take communion, and we need to take it frequently, but we need to do it with the preparation of prayer and to the best of our ability to, to, to confess and repent our sins when we come so that we can get the most benefit out of it. None of us is worthy of communion. None of us. But God commands us to do it otherwise, right? Anyways, he wants us to do it. He, knowing that we're not worthy, okay? So don't worry about your unworthiness. You have to rely on God's grace because he asked you to do this. Just prepare the best you can, okay? All right, so thanks for that question. All right, any other questions? Uh, this, 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 I got two questions written down. That, so uh, anyone else have a question here that, that I can answer? Otherwise, we're gonna go to trivia day and, and that's gonna spur all the questions. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Cheryl. I have a question that's pretty random. Uh huh. But, um, somewhere, I think I have heard the words, the beauty of thy face, O oh Christ. Is, is that, do you, does that ring a bell to you as far as this sermon is concerned? I think in Holy Week, I think uh, for uh, Holy Week, we sing that on for the bridegroom mans, I believe. Is that where you Yes. Know? Yeah. I, I can't recall off top, but I, I'm pretty familiar. I think I'm. Pretty sure that's where okay. it comes from. So then that yeah. Uh huh. Um, or beauty of the bridal says, chamber, I think it says. Oh, I, the, so yeah, bridal I chamber. Think yeah. It says specifically yeah. About the beauty of the face of Christ. Right. But then in um, in the book of Isaiah and other places, it says, in Psalms, it says he has no form or comeliness that we should desire him. So it seems like Christ was not physically beautiful. I don't know. I don't know if we're judging God by our, our earthly standards with, with beauty. I, I, uh, well, I mean, you know, we see in the icons that, uh -huh. you know, he looks, he's handsome, he's, he's attractive in uh -huh. the icons. Uh -huh. Those far as him uh -huh. I don't know how to answer that, but I, I can give commentary, okay. <laughs> give you perspective. So when we look at the icons of Christ, like the big panacrat or above, uh, anytime we see the icon of Christ, we're, we're supposed to see the icon of man. He's the son of man. He, we're supposed to look at that icon and see the beauty of all mankind in him. Because this is, he has now become man for our sakes, for our salvation. And so when we ever see a picture of, of Christ, we're supposed to see the image of our brothers and sisters and that image of Christ. And that should be beautiful, right? It should be beauty uh, because everybody possesses beauty because we're all children of God, not in its physical appearance, you know, attractiveness. That doesn't matter. The beauty is, is that, that we're children of God. And so um, it's difficult when we see our, our brothers, especially those who may have hurt us, some of those that we don't agree with, some of those that uh, are just awful people, but we're supposed to look at them and see the same image that we see when we look at the icon of Christ. So a uh, big task for us. Um, so when we see the icon of Christ, we should see our brothers. When we see our brothers, we see the icon of Christ. I don't know if that gives you any perspective, but it should be a beautiful thing, but it's difficult, right? It's difficult, yeah. Okay. All right. Yes. Uh, I remember reading the story I don't know if this is like an official, but like Mary Magdalene first encountered Jesus. And it kind of talked about like, it kind of hinted towards like his face, like he was the ideal. So like people saw Christ, I guess, differently. He didn't have one specific face, but when they saw him, they saw the ideal man. Like in the Roman account where they have him blonde and blue eyes. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, Christ existed materially, but at a, another, like when the apostles didn't recognize him after uh -huh. his resurrection because his form kind of was. 
Well, that's different. Yeah. That's, yeah. I don't, so I, I always wonder. So the human person of Jesus, who was fully human, fully God, so when he walked this earth, he had a, a, a physical feature. A, 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 he looked probably like a Semitic man would look, <laughs> a Hebrew man. And so we ha can't uh, ignore the historical account of Jesus. He was truly lived on this earth at a specific time and looked a specific way and had a specific ethnicity that comes from a specific background. That, that's undeniable. Now, throughout time, you know, we fall in love with people and we see them for what we, see, what we want to see them. And that maybe that's, uh, you know, why people depict them in a different way. I mean, I've seen black Jesus and African icons in Ethiopia. I've seen the, the white Jesus with the blonde hair and the blue eyes. Is that historically accurate? Probably not. <laughs> I'm 100% sure it's not. But we depict them because we see them, see Jesus in us. Again, we have to see Jesus in us. And that's what they're trying to do. And that's a lot. That'll yeah. give you my next question. Yeah. That's allowable as far as the Orthodox they give a little bit of leeway in sure. the Asian churches to kind of... Yeah. I mean, canonically, when it comes to iconography, it's not accurate. But um, when it comes to, you know, just devotion and piety, it's not a big deal. Jesus is everyone, you know. Yeah. He's, he's beyond, what, you know, beyond this earth. So um, as far as your point, after he resurrected, he was different. They didn't... He, and this will be the true with us when we're resurrected, that our, uh, our bodies are going to be different. It'll be as if uh, we didn't go through this fallen earth because, you know, our humanity is, is regulated to the fallenness of, of, uh, from, the, from the fall of Adam and Eve. So we, we, we take on disease and death and all, all those things that come with it. But when we are resurrected now, it's going to be as it was. And so we are going to look different. We're going to be different. We'll be more spiritual people, even in physical form. And that's why they didn't recognize Jesus all the time, because he wasn't in his earthly appearance when he was resurrected. He was in his resurrection, like, true form of what, what, what a mankind was supposed to be, what, what it's supposed to be before the fall. Right. Sorry. That's the same Veronica. Yeah, same Veronica. On his, uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, the mandolin. It's, yeah, St. Veronica, uh, by tradition, he wiped his face when he was processing the Golgotha with the cross. And um, you see this oftentimes, and in, in even in Roman Catholics, uh, stations of the cross. It's not, a, it's not a service that we do, but you'll see this as part of the, on his way. He wiped us. And then we, this was sent to King Abgar in Edessa. So the tradition is and that, that this, and we see this, this mandolin. This, uh, it's called the, we have a feast day for it, the uh, Holy Napkin. Um, and this is a, the, the image not made by hands. So, yes, there's a tradition. Uh, we have this, this tradition in the church. Yes. Yeah. And you'll see it's a very popular icon of the face of Christ. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. So when Christ was transfigured on a mountain, he was Jesus. Yeah. Is that same? Yes. Yeah. Yes. But, the, but the, the, as you, if we know by the hymns that they, and by the scriptures, they couldn't, they could only see him as far as they were able to be able to see him with their earthly eyes. Right. And that's how we are, too. Like, we can really can't comprehend God. I got a good question from one of the kids upstairs. They wanted to know, what, you know, if God was created. Bef like, well, because I told them God created everything in this world, right, before there was anything. And they said, well, what did God see? What was there? There was nothing. Could he just see out and see? I said, well, God didn't have, you know, he doesn't have eyes, physical eyes. When we say he sees, you know, it's uh, we don't know what it is like to be God, <laughs> Like, can we even comprehend to be God, you know, and spirit? So good questions from the kids. They want to understand, but we can't understand. We can't even comprehend what it means to be the pre-eternal force for everything that you in the universe that was before anything was. So our minds just are not big enough to comprehend that. Right. So. Okay. Yeah, you know what? I like it. I'd rather do that than this because these are for kids. These are for student questions, and I was wondering if my adults would be able to do it. Where he talks about that um, nobody's ever heard the voice of God. Like Moses in the burning bush, that was Jesus mm -hmm. speaking. Was it and like it was Jesus speaking to Abraham? And mm -hmm. So the, the voice only I don't know if it's certain angels who could hear the voice of God. Um, but then the, on Epiphany, when Jesus is baptized and the, the, the voice comes and it says, "This is my son from whom I'm well pleased." Mm -hmm. So like 
that's the only time, like, I, I don't understand. So was that the only time, or did, was that not the voice of God, or did people not hear that? That, that, that was... I don't know. If, I don't know if what you're referring to, but I'll try to clarify a little bit. So, when 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 we get the prefigurements of Christ in the Old Testament, that's what it, that's what we see it as, like the burning bush, uh, the uh, um, Abraham, you know, the angels coming and visiting Abraham. This prefigurements of Christ. Remember, Christ is God. Yeah. Right. And I know that the Trinity is such a mystery. So, he's not he's he's not the person of God, the Father, but. He, they don't, they're never separated. There's never a time they were separated. So when God, Jesus acts, God the Father is acting. And so when they see God, Jesus, in the burning bush, it's God the Father. It's, I know it's, a, it's a really hard to wrap our heads around, um, but those are prefigurements of, the, of Christ, and that's God the Father. So they hear God. Um, when we hear the God the Father coming down... Uh, yeah, that's him. Uh, I, I mean, it's just a, it, the person of, they're, they're truly hearing what God, you know, remember the angels communicate. Remember we went this uh, several months ago, we talked about, the, we did something on the angel, angelic hosts and how they don't hear and they can't speak, but they can only communicate between each other by thought. And then when you think, they, th they hear it. Like it, it, they, they know whatever, they, they, can, they know what she, they're thinking. Do you remember that? Yeah. So, in a sense, you know, we can't comprehend how God chooses to manifest his way to communicate with us. Whether they heard it or not, they, they felt it and they knew it. That was God. And they, God sent this dove descending in the Holy Spirit. He did it all so that we can comprehend it. He, he condescends himself to us so that we can, in our state, understand what's going on. Whether or not they heard it or they didn't, they knew that's yeah, who it was. It so long. Yeah. I remember the context yeah. why, he, why he brought that up. I just remember it. Maybe, I don't know. I'd have to read it. I, I don't know. But you remember, though, God and Christ, even though they're two persons, they're, they're so interconnected, they don't act apart from each other. So when we hear Christ in the Old Testament, we're hearing God. Okay? We can't separate them. Yeah. I, am, I am he and he is I, as he told Nathaniel. And they said, well, why don't you show us the God the Father? Remember this? He says, when can you show us God the Father? He says, don't, how long have you been with me? Like, when you see me, you see God the Father. That's what, you see Christ's words. Right? Remember that. Yeah. Yeah. It's always, yeah, we're the same. Right. This is good. I'm just glad we know that God talks to us, you know, like if, we're, if we listen. Right? Like, He doesn't physically talk to us. Even now, we can say, God talks to me. Like, God, God spoke to me. But does he, did He speak? Did we hear Him in our ears? Again, it's, a, like a, it's a more of a spiritual, like, we, we communicate on, the, on a higher plane, on the spiritual plane. And I would assume that's the same that happened on, on uh, Holy Theophany. Though they said like thunder, you know, who knows? Yeah. And it feels like that. I think that's where God is. Yeah. Voice like, like thunder. Yes. I think that's where yeah. Kind of mm -hmm. threw yeah. me off, I guess. Like, good. Thank you. Thanks. I don't know if I clarify anything, but. No, I don't. I just don't want any to get you the wrong idea of how, who God is in the yeah. Trinity. The Trinity is very hard to understand. It's, yeah. We've got to be consistent with it, though. If we, when we say God, we mean Jesus. And when we say Jesus, we mean God. Okay. Right. She's she's an Aryan. <laughs> That's Arianism. <laughs> yeah. So cool. Any other any other things? All right, let's throw some stuff out there. So this is uh this is questions for orthodoxy, unorthodoxy, A to Z for students. So we're all students, right? We should be all disciples. And they, they break it down, scripture stuff. It's Old Testament, New Testament, and it's just basic trivia about orthodoxy. So let's not embarrass ourselves on uh, scripture. Let's go. Oh, they, so they have liturgics as well. So, um, I think I'll be all right with liturgics. Let's go to church traditions and teachings, okay? And these are... Some of them are. You just want true-false? Because they have true-false in here, too. <laughs> so, so, uh, so which of the following statements are true about saints? Um, saints have come predominantly from the wealthy classes. 
Saints were perfect people who committed no sins. All saints are well known and their stories have all been well uh, been uh, all written. Saints are people who have consecrated themselves wholly to strive to express the love of God in their lives. Last one. Last one. Saints are perfect people who committed no sins. Last one. So uh, they wanted us, the reason why they, and I like this question, is because they, A, B, and C are, are um, put there so that you know that you can be a saint. That's what we're working for. Yeah. We're all working to be saints. So, uh, so it doesn't matter that what class you come from, wealthy or poor. Um, if the saints have come from all classes. It doesn't matter how many sins and how wretched of life you've lived. Ask St. Paul, the persecutor of the church. Uh, you can still become a great saint. Um, and you don't have to be well known. Uh, in fact, most of our saints are unheard of, right? That's why we celebrate all saints. For, to, to be honest, all saints is to recognize all the saints, even those who are not even known to, to us because they've lived a, such a quiet, humble life out of sight of everyone, right? And they've never been re recognized as who they really are. So, despite all that, you can become a saint. So, I like this question because it's telling why you. Why not? Yeah. Why not? God, why should God settle for less? Come on. We, we, so, as long as we try, right, George? Says we're just trying to be holy. It's, we have that's to the be point. Saints. Why should yeah. God take less? Yeah. What was the why, why should we take the less? Last one? The last question, the last one was saints are people who have consecrated themselves wholly to strive to express the love of God in their lives. What does consecrated themselves Consecrated means that they've dedicated. Oh. oh. Dedicated. I just read that too. Yeah. I thought like that they claim themselves to be saints. No, no, they've, de they've dedicated, okay. let me just say, they have dedicated themselves wholly, uh, fully <laughs> to strive to express the love of God. Whole, like whole, not, not holy, but holy, yes. fully, fully, yeah, okay, all right, so uh, let's talk about the sacraments, which of the following statements is true about orthodox perspective on salvation, okay, salvation, I like this one too, we can earn salvation through good works, that's A, B, because we are baptized, we, are, we will be saved, C, we are saved by the grace of God through faith, which naturally manifests itself in love and good works. Or D, we are saved by faith alone. C. Uh, C. C. I, this always confuses me, the faith works thing. And I know this is part of the Protestant Reformation. Yeah. And what was C? C, it says, we are saved by the grace of God through faith, which naturally manifests itself in love and good works. So there's no works? There's no works? Well, no, 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 no. He says, it, he says it manifests itself in love and good works. Okay. So we're not, we're not saved by faith alone, right? Because uh, I can believe in Jesus and act like a fool. I said, no, but I truly believe that's God and act like a fool. That's like a Baptist. Yeah. Right, right. Like, they, they believe, because I believe, I'm saved. Right. So... Um, we earn salvation through good works. This is never a teaching, ever. Not even in the Catholic Church is this a teaching, where the Protestants tend to say it. But we can't, we can't just do good works and then, and then not really believe. Like, you know, just as, uh, as we had a good sermon from Father Gehrman today, right? The, the Pharisee did all the great works, but he didn't have the dispensation, the, the, the proper heart. And so with all the good works just went for naught. All right, And then, because we are baptized, we will be saved. So, just because we're baptized in the faith, guys, as an infant on the 40th day, doesn't mean we get to walk into heaven, right? So, it's all false. Those are all false. We are saved by grace, uh, by God through grace. So, we're, God's the one who saves. God is always the one who saves. And we have to have faith. And because we have faith, we will do good works. That's how good, that's what faith and work means. That's how it works, Right? Because we have faith in God and we believe His commandments and we act to walk that path, naturally we're going to do good works. We're going to do good things. Now, that that makes sense? Yeah, but this is my question. <laughs> this is and this is why I'm using the it's trivia. So, so, so we have. <laughs> I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying the question is. So, people will say faith. Yes. Nobody has. Most won't have. 
true faith. So it's kind of like without the work, without practicing the work, putting into work, like praying, mm -hmm. following your spirit, uh, prayer with one church, believe with the four, how are you expressing your faith? So, so are there people, obviously, that can be saved who may not necessarily, if you ask them, say, do I believe in Jesus and all that, they say, I don't know about all that. You know, do I actually believe it? I don't know. But they live their life accordingly. Mm -hmm. you, you know, it's like a, it's a distinction of like, okay, but what is faith? So faith is the, is, the, is the hope of those things to come that you cannot see manifest. So you, 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 you're, you're believing in something that you cannot physically see or know that's going to come, but you, you have hope in it, that it will be manifest. Like, king, like the kingdom of God, the heavens, right? Well, yeah, like, like so, so he's talking about non-orthodox that, that um, don't have the law, but they practice the law in their heart. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have orthodoxy, you know, but is that what you mean? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's just, I, I get it, <laughs> but it's, it's tough, like, conceptually, like, to say that, it's one thing to say you have faith, and it's another thing to actually have faith. You know what I mean? So is it the, is it the proclamation that I have faith, that I do believe in these things? Like, or, because, like, Jesus says, if you have the faith, actual faith, the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. You know what I mean? So, like, other than the same, who has who actually has faith other than saying I have faith? Well, well, faith faith grows. So you can have faith in it. It could be weak, right? Yeah. You can have faith and be weak. When we say we faith, when we talk about faith and belief in this perspective, and then it all comes through these uh, really more Protestant ideas about, you know, believing in, the, the Bible says, if those who believe in me will be baptized will be saved. Okay? So when they're saying believe, I mean, they believe... Jesus is who he says he is, okay? So all the other mysteries of the church, we may, we may struggle with that. But if we can at least say we believe in Jesus as the Son of God who, who, who came into this world as God and man, that's the, that's the basis of our faith. There's a lot more that goes to it, but can we say at least I believe that that's the Son of God, right? So, and we can be baptized on that. Then that's, I think, in the scriptures, that's the basis of faith, to believe in Jesus as who he says he is. And who, now, there's a lot more that goes to that that might be kind of, you know, the, our church is deeper than that. Yeah. You know, our theology is deeper than that. And there's going to be a lot more required of us. To, but that's, that's we grow in that, right? This is when we're baptized, we're given a seed of faith, right? The Holy Spirit is descended upon us. When we're baptized in Christmas, we're given a seed, a kernel planted within us. And that has to be watered and, 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 and plowed and cultivated. And then it grows, grows, and grows. Okay. It's not supposed to remain a seed, but faith, it's still faith, even if it's small. Right? What would that be the works? The works are going to be manifest itself, as I said, because you have some faith. It can be little or small, but it's going to manifest itself. If you have any even little faith, you're going to, have, you're going to do little works. You know, if I really believe in Jesus and all his teachings, I can't walk by somebody who's in need and in suffering and just ignore them, Right? I might extend a hand and say, hey, okay, can I, you know, can I help you? Can, is something you need? That's manifest. I'm, I'm, I believe who Jesus is. I can't be cold to my brother. That's manifesting our faith. Right? Yeah. That's manifesting your faith. Does that get you into heaven because you did that? No. No. But it, it shows who you are, your character, and how you react. Because you have faith, even if it's a weak faith. So don't don't think of faith like uh, you know like the saints or you know uh, you're you're not there. It's a process. It's a long process. Uh, if you even have uh, the tiniest faith, that might be enough to get you into heaven, AJ. As long as you have faith, you know. You know so and um, even Saint Paul says that the people uh, the you know that those who have no faith at all don't even know Jesus will be judged on a different whole different scale, right? It's, how can it be their fault they didn't believe in Christ? They never heard of them, right? So they're going to have natural law to, that God has kind of implanted in all of us. We know that killing somebody is it's not good, even if we don't believe in Jesus and Christ. And so we're going to be judged, you know, those who don't have faith. God can still, is, is still, God wants to save them. God wants to save them. And he's not going to judge, well, my gosh, you didn't believe me. You didn't believe that I was Christ. Well, he never heard of this Christ. So 
And sometimes people get the image of Christ, of a, a false Christ, because we believers don't manifest him very well in our lives because we don't have good works, right? We, we're, we're, and sometimes we're cold and sometimes we're, we're mean and judgy. And so people don't want anything to do with the Christ that we say that is truly God. Is that their fault? Because we were bad representatives of Jesus. So it's all, it's very complicated. Salvation ultimately is the grace of God. It's a gift of God. But if we truly believe even the little bits, we're going to have good works. And that's, don't worry about anybody else. Okay. And how little or great their faith is. Yeah, my faith is weak too. I have doubts. You have doubts. You have doubts. You have doubts. We all have doubts. Yeah, right? We're always going to have it. And we're not, you know, and we're going to seem like, man, my faith is kind of weak. But we rely on God. You know, I always I love this, the, the reading that we do. We get it once a year, but the, uh, the, the, the father with the epileptic son, mm-hmm. right? They call it a lunatic, you know, in the old language. They would call these kids lunatic. They were epileptic. And in, in, in Christ, am I going to ever find faith on this earth when I come back? Christ said this to everyone. When I come back, will anyone have faith here? Anyone have faith? And in, in the, in the, what the father says, I have faith. Just help my unbelief. I love it because that's every one of us. Right? We have, we, I do believe, but I mean, I suck at it. Just, just be, be merciful to me. And that's what it end up comes, that's what it's going to come down to. Okay? But, we should, but if we have even a little faith, we should manifest it in doing good to people and doing good things. That's, that is true. Okay? All right. Let's see. Let's do another question. Uh, okay, when we make this, this is an open-ended question. No, no, no uh, multiple choice. When we make the sign of the cross, what do the three fingers we put together represent? The Trinity, right? So let's have an open discussion. Was it always this way? No. In the history of the church? In the history of the church? Yeah. I guess not. Yeah. I would say yes. Yes. I think the East and the West always did it differently, didn't they? Even before the split. Yeah. So no. <laughs> There's actually a tome uh, by uh, a, uh, an epistle by uh, I think what Pope, one of the Pope Leos, was before the uh, I think is in the eighth century, who said that he wrote a tome, Pope of, Pope of Rome, said this is how we make the sign of the cross. This is how we make the sign of the cross. And so uh, the Catholics changed. Uh, for, I don't know culturally, whatever. But there was, also a, there was also a time where these three fingers were the ones that were, they didn't, these three fingers were held and this, they had two fingers, right? It's just the opposite. We have these two fingers that are down, right? This is supposed to, you guys know what these ones mean? Two natures. The two natures of Christ. So he was man and God. Honor. Yeah, well, yes. Yeah. And then this is, the, and so, but the old believers in the old right, they used to say that this, and if you'll see this, that there's actually icons of Christ blessing this way, right? You see this. And they blessed themselves. That this was a big controversy in the Russian church. It made a big split because uh, the Greeks did it a different way. And so the Russians said, well, let's do it. Let's all be the same. We'll do it like the Greeks. And, and they said, wait, no, no, no. This is how we do it. <laughs> it was only how we did it. And so there's a there's split. This is where we came part of their old believer schism in the Russian church. But so there was a... a, a various practices but ultimately we're, we're crossing ourselves with the trinity with the father son and holy spirit whether we did it this way or we did it this way <laughs> we're, we're blessing ourselves with the trinity the priest actually blessed themselves this way they bless people this way you know what this is okay i see it's making the letters i see and we make an x and a c so you're making an i and a c and an x and a C, what it means, Jesus Christ. So we're blessing you with Jesus Christ. So I always try to tell everyone, when you take a blessing from the priest, forget that the priest stands before you, that as a man, it's Jesus that's giving you a blessing. It's Jesus that's giving you a blessing. You're asking for Jesus' blessing. It's never my position to say, no, I can't give you a blessing. Because I'm not blessing, it's Jesus' blessing you're receiving. And likewise, when you reject the, the priest's blessing, you're not rejecting the poor, sinful priest, you're rejecting Jesus' blessing. So people are not comfortable getting the priest's blessing because of the, I don't want to venerate the hand. It's kind of a, in the Western world, it seems like an odd piety. But what you're really afraid of is getting Jesus' blessing. You forget that I'm a man standing before you. It's Jesus standing before you. He's, he's blessing you. 
And so whenever I do anything like that liturgically, when I give communion, it's, we say the prayers, the priest says is that Jesus giving, he says, you give the communion, uh, Jesus through us give the communion. We say this prayer before I give it. So it's not me giving you communion, it's Jesus giving you communion. Christ is the one who distributes it. I'm mystically just a, a tool. I'm a servant, I'm a slave. He's just working, I'm like a puppet. Okay, so that, that's how you got to think of it. So this is Jesus Christ, it means I-C-X-E. All right, let's get a controversial one here. Uh, in the Nicene Constantinople, Constantinople in Creed, uh, we state that we believe in a concise but accurate, in, uh, we, we, believe, we state what we believe in concise but accurate form. Of course, this does not include all things that the church believes, which of the following is a belief of the church that is not included in the creed? Belief in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is Trinity. Uh, belief in one holy church. Belief in the creation of the world by God. Belief in the use of icons in the church. Boy, yeah, we don't talk about icons in the creed, do we? Does that mean that we don't believe in it? Yeah. I, some people have a hard time believing that, you know, because you know, this, again, we come from a very, we're in a Western country, in a Protestant country. They have a hard time believing that anything that's not found in, in Scripture is actually a legitimate belief, right? Even though in the end of St. John's um, Gospel, he says, well, there's millions of things that Jesus said and did that if we put them all in a book, it, there could be no library that can contain it all. That's from St. John in the scriptures. But yet people say, well, but it's not in the Bible. How could it be true? Well, listen, again, there's a, millions of things that Christ said and did that couldn't be fit in this Bible. So we have a belief. It doesn't have to be stated uh, in paper, in, in a book, and even in the creed. We believe a lot more than that. That's just a concise belief. of, of all, And really, the creed came down to um, factors of, of, of disagreement. Right? The creed was, was made because there were disagreements on certain beliefs of the church. There was a disagreement about who Jesus was. Was he Christ, God? There was a disagreement about um, who created the world and how it was created. There's disagreement on who the Holy Spirit was. There's disagreement on who is, uh, who, what the church is. This is where we have all these, what we call schisms and heresies throughout time. And the church came together and said, okay, this is what we actually believe. And they put it in the creed. So what you find in the creed is only those things that were really disputed and caused scandal in the church. That doesn't mean that everything that wasn't included in the creed uh, did not belong in our faith. It just means it wasn't even an issue at the time that they did it. They only talked about the things that were an issue. Okay? Only talked about. And you'll notice that all the time. Like when we have our traditions, oftentimes... Like, we just assume a lot about our faith. It's not even in the scriptures, but it's because everyone believed it at one point. It wasn't until later on that there was, well, prove it to me. Like, where's it at in scripture? That, this is a new phenomenon. We don't, that's not how we believe our faith. That's not how the church is. Any, in fact, there's uh, centuries where there was no written New Testament, right? We didn't have a new written testament where we could open it up and say, let's, let me go in this fifth chapter of John. There was none of that. We just believed what the faith was, and that was inherited. People didn't even read, by the way. How many people were illiterate? So it's a very modern way to, to analyze our faith, to open up the Bible, it's, which is a good practice to know what's in there. But, so, but well, I don't know. It kind of says here, and I don't see anywhere else. It's a very modern way to believe our faith. And we don't, it's, not, it's, not, it's not how we do things. Okay, That's why we have a tradition that precedes. Tradition, the scripture is part of the tradition. Scripture over is overarching. Scripture is just a part of our tradition. It's one part of it. One part of it. And so is the creed. One part of it. Of many things. You guys are good. You guys are doing well. I'm going to get you guys, recruit you guys to be in Sunday school upstairs too. No, you have one behind you, he just said. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think uh, when I encountered Orthodox people, what you just said, a lot of people don't know how to respond to a Protestant who is saying, mm -hmm. um, that's not in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And that's the 
the best response that there is, what you just said, mm -hmm. it's what it's what convinced me mm -hmm. is we gave you the Bible. You know, the church gave you the Bible mm -hmm. and there's so much more. And that that verse that you're talking about. Yeah. When I read that as a as a person who was seeking an orthodoxy, that said to me all of a sudden it, it said something completely different mm -hmm. as so many scriptures have done since I became Orthodox. So yeah. That the idea that um, you know there is so much more than this book. Yeah. That Scripture is a primary way that God reveals himself to us, but yeah. it's not the only way. But it's not the only way. Right, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And without the context of the church, your friend is yeah. looking through a small lens. You know, in the context of the church, that lens becomes wider. Right. And more is revealed than you ever thought possible. I had, uh, uh, you know, you guys, I know many of you know that I have a YouTube page. I put a lot of this stuff on, right? Uh, okay. So I got a, got a lot of people sending me messages because uh, it says the Orthodox experience with Father Michael. And a lot of, I get a lot of snippy Protestants. Says, we don't call any man fa you know, father. You can't call any man. So I, I produce something you know, in response to that. But it tells you how we read Scripture and understand Scripture. Um, so are you, you guys feel bad about, you know, you guys, most of you are Orthodox for a long time or grew up in the faith. It doesn't, you guys don't even think about this. There is a scripture that Christ says, don't call no man father and don't call any man teacher. Right? There's only one father in heaven and you only have one teacher. So how do we deal with that? That I'm Father Michael and you're not supposed to call me father. And you're not supposed to have any teacher but, but God, no rabbi, but, I, I, I'm, the, but I, I'm here sitting before you try to teach something. How do we, what do we make sense of that? It says it right in the Bible. It says that. Yeah, but, we, but so how do we deal with that? You're not teaching your own thing. You're teaching what's been passed down. And it's, it's because we don't read scripture with any context. And Protestants are very bad about this sometimes. We don't look at any context of the scriptures. And we don't look at any other. Um, and we're looking at it through our lens of our own ideology. Okay. So Christ said this to the Pharisees who were. As you can imagine, uh, they were like these, they were these elders that wanted disciples. They wanted disciples because by having lots of disciples, they get fame and notoriety and probably also financial benefit, right? People wanted to follow these teachers of these rabbis. And so what Christ was going, he was attacking these rabbis for what they were doing, right? These, these teachers who, who wished to be looked upon as father, wished to be looked at as, as teacher, as these elders above people. So he was telling them that you are arrogant and prideful and that you shouldn't seek this. You shouldn't want to seek this out. So he's not saying that because he honestly told us to honor our father. Our father and our mother in the commandments calls him father. Uh, Paul says that we uh, that we have uh, him as the father in the faith. He has begotten the faith. He has begotten us, birthed us as a father, spiritual father. So he says in his epistles to, his, to those people he, he converted. He says, I am your spiritual father. I begot you. I created you as a Christian. And he has no problem saying that. And he has no, we have no problem saying Christ himself saying that the, our fathers Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, that I am the God of the fathers. So it's, it's out of context. So we can go to your Protestant background. There's a lot of them that are very well versed in scripture and they can quote it. And then sometimes we get a little bit, uh, when people tell us this, we get a little gun shy about our own faith because, well, they're right when they quote it. It's, it sounds like what they're saying, but they have no context. And without the tradition of the church, it, it can be mean. They're the same people that, that don't believe that the body and blood of Christ is what it is, even though that's what it says in Scripture. So you, you can always pull that on them, always, always pull that on them. So what do you think about the body and blood? <laughs> even though Christ literally said, this is my body and my blood. And also, right? where's the word Trinity? Yeah. It's not. Again, it goes to, like yeah. Hearing, yeah. The only time it's found is when we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But that's the only time it's found in Scripture. Uh, it's that you go and baptize and make disciples in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? At the end of Mark, I think it says, or Matthew. And, but we've always believed it. And, but that's why it's in the Creed, because that was kind of contentious by some, who the Holy Spirit was, how the Trinity was. But it was there. It was implied. It was implied. The Jewish faith, by the way, of, the, of, uh, of today is not the Jewish faith that Jesus was. They, they believe different things. 
they were reformed. They've been reformed several times. So um, we also we, we assume that the Trinity would have been scandalous to a lot of the Jews, but it wasn't. They they understood that God manifests Himself in various ways in the Old Testament, um, various ways, and then that it wasn't like this very strict monotheistic God only God the Father as we got in Judaism today. That was not the case. That was never the case in Judaism. They understand. They they understand like the, the angel of the Lord, uh, the, God, the Lord of Sabaoth, uh, the Lord of Hosts. These were all manifest here, and they came down and they would talk to people. This was this was the God, and, but it wasn't God Yahweh. They they ta- they used different terms and knowledge, but it was still God. It's only today's strict monotheism, which was born out of a, a revolt against Christianity. It's not the same. We're not monotheistic, like Orthodox Christians. Like, people think we're like they all group Christians as monotheistic. Mm-hmm. We, don't, we don't consider ourselves monotheistic. We believe that there's God with a lowercase g. That there's other. That's per, that's a provocative statement. Yeah, that, that, that's what I call it. That's what yeah. I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, it's a provocative statement because we. Uh, he's he, what he's saying is that there's that, that, that we always thought there were other gods, but not in the true sense of a God, that, that there were other spirits that, you know, ain't, we looked at angels as gods. We looked at, um, in the Old Testament, we always say he's the God of gods. Who's, who's such a great of God as our God? Like we say, these are a hymnography. This comes from the, the scriptures. So we understood that there were other uh, false gods and those false gods are not like equal gods. They were, they were demons. Yeah, and that's what you're saying. It was yes. about demons. And it was about demons. Yes. It talks about the Jewish, the Jewish yes. that used to be this way. Yeah. Monotheistic, that word didn't even exist. Right. Like, that was even Mm-hmm. That they, used. Yeah. So, like, so we we really believe in one God. That's true. I guess it's just not that uh, we believe in one God and that there's only one true God. But we also know that there's other um, there were there were fallen spirits that presented themselves as God, and that's what idol worship was. When we worshipped the false God, it was an it wasn't God another.